On July 19, 1977, the world teacher, the Christ Maitreya, head of the spiritual hierarchy, emerged from his ancient retreat and is now in the modern world. With his disciples, the masters of the wisdom, he will inaugurate the new age of synthesis and brotherhood. Good morning and welcome to our World Teacher Programme on Wellington's Access Radio 106.1 FM. Presented by Teresa and David on behalf of Share International New Zealand. We'll start today by reading a series of quotes taken from Alice A. Bailey's book called The Problems of Humanity. This information was given through her by the Master Dwal Kul. And although written after the Second World War, it is even more relevant in today's world. The Master DK touches upon the historical background of humanity's problems and offers logical advice as to how these problems can be solved, namely through goodwill and the sharing of the world's resources. The Master DK states that goodwill is man's first attempt to express the love of God. Its results on earth will be peace. It is so simple and practical that people fail to appreciate its potency or its scientific and dynamic effect. One person sincerely practicing goodwill in a family can completely change its attitudes. Goodwill practiced among groups in any nation, by political and religious parties in any nation, and among all the nations of the world, can revolutionize the world. The key to humanity's trouble focusing as it has in the economic difficulties of the past 200 years and in the theological impasse of the Orthodox churches, has been to take and not give, to accept and not share, to grasp and not to distribute. This has involved the breaking of a law which has placed humanity in a position of positive guilt, War is the dire penalty which mankind has had to pay for this great sin of separateness. Humanity has never really lived up to the teaching given to it. Spiritual impression, whether conveyed by the Christ, by Krishna or by Buddha and passed on to the masses by their disciples, has not yet been expressed as it was hoped. Men do not live up to what they already know. They fail to make practical their information. They short-circuit the light. They do not discipline themselves. Greedy desire and unlawful ambition control, and not the inner knowledge. Most men today think in terms of their own nation or group, and this is their largest concept. They have progressed beyond the stage of their individual physical and mental well-being, and are visioning the possibility of adding their quota of usefulness and of stability to the national whole. They are seeking to be cooperative, to understand and to further the good of the community. This is descriptive of many thousands in many nations. This spirit and attitude will someday characterise the attitude of nation to nation. At present this is not so, and a very different psychology rules. Nations seek and demand the best for themselves, no matter what the cost to others. They regard this as a right attitude and as characteristic of good citizenship. Nations are coloured by hatreds and prejudices, many of which are as unwarranted today as foul language in a religious meeting. Nations are split and divided within themselves by racial barriers, by party differences, and by religious attitudes. These inevitably bring disorder and finally disaster. An intense spirit of nationalism, assertive and boastful, distinguishes the citizens of most countries, particularly in relation to each other. This breeds dislike, distrust and the disruption of right human relations. All nations are guilty of these qualities and attitudes. 
expressed according to their individual culture and genius. All nations, as all families, have also in them groups or individuals who are recognised sources of trouble to the well-intentioned remainder. There are nations within the international community which are, and have been for a long time, disrupting agencies. History indicates a long past of battle, of war, of changing frontiers, of the discovery and prompt annexation of new territory involving the subjugation of the original inhabitants, sometimes greatly to their benefit, but always inexcusable. The spirit of nationalism and its growth is the background of modern history, as taught in our schools. Feeding national pride, engendering national enmities, racial hatreds and jealousies. History concerns itself with the lines of demarcation between countries and with the type of rule each country developed. These lines of demarcation are fiercely held and passports indicate the crystallisation of the idea. History portrays the fierce determination of every nation to preserve its boundaries at any cost, to keep its culture and civilization intact, to add to them when possible and to share nothing with any other nation except for commercial profit, for which international legislation is provided. Yet all the time humanity is one humanity, and the products of the earth belong to all. This wrong attitude has not only fostered the sense of separateness, but has led to the exploitation of the weaker groups by the stronger, and the wrecking of the economic life of the masses by a mere handful of powerful groups. Ancient habits of mass thinking and of mass reaction are difficult to overcome. It is here that the main battleground of the world is found. Public opinion will have to be re-educated. The nations are reverting to the deep-seated modes of behaviour and thought which have characterised them for generations. We need, in the general interest, to face up to our past, to recognise the new trends, to renounce the old ways of thinking and acting, if humanity is not to descend to greater depths than in the last war. The distribution of the world's resources and the settled unity of the peoples of the world are in reality one and the same thing. For behind all modern wars lies a fundamental economic problem. Solve that and wars will very largely cease. In considering, therefore, the preservation of peace as sought for and emphasised by the United Nations at this time, it becomes immediately apparent that peace, security and world stability are primarily tied up with the economic problem. When there is freedom from want, one of the major causes of war will disappear. Where there is uneven distribution of the world's riches, and where there is a situation in which some nations have or take everything, and other nations lack the necessities of life, it is obvious that there is a trouble-breeding factor there and that something must be done. Therefore, we should deal with world unity and peace primarily from the angle of the economic problem. It is essential for the future happiness and progress of humanity that there should be no return to the old ways, whether political, religious or economic, Therefore, in handling these problems, we should search out the wrong conditions which have brought humanity to its present state of almost cataclysmic disaster. These conditions were the result of religious faiths which have not moved forward in their thinking for hundreds of years, of economic systems which lay the emphasis upon the accumulation of riches and material possessions, and which leave all the power and the produce of the earth in the hands of a relatively few men, while the rest of humanity struggle for a bare subsistence, and of political regimes run by the corrupt, the totalitarian minded, and those who love place and power more than they love their fellow men. Security, happiness and peaceful relations are desired by all, until, however, the great powers 
in collaboration with the little nations, have solved the economic problem and have realized that the resources of the earth belong to not one nation but to humanity as a whole. There will be no peace. The oil of the world, the mineral wealth, the wheat, the sugar and the grains belong to all men everywhere. They are essential to the daily living of every man. The true problem of the United Nations is a twofold one. It involves the right distribution of the world's resources so that there may be freedom from want. And it involves also the bringing about of a true equality of opportunity and of education for all men everywhere. The nations which have a wealth of resources are not owners. They are custodians of the world's riches and hold them in trust for their fellow men. The time will inevitably come when, in the interest of peace and security, the capitalists in the various nations will be forced to realise this and will also be forced to substitute the principle of sharing for the ancient principle which has hitherto governed them of greedy grabbing. There was a time, a hundred years or more ago, when a just distribution of the world's wealth would have been impossible. That is not true today. Statistics exist. Computations have been made. Investigation has penetrated into every field of the Earth's resources, and these investigations, computations and statistics have been published and are available to the public. The men in power in every nation know well exactly what food, minerals, oil and other necessities are available for worldwide use upon just and equitable lines. But these commodities are reserved by the nations involved as talking and bargaining points. The problem of distribution is no longer difficult once the food of the world is freed from politics and from capitalism. It must also be remembered that the means of distribution by sea, rail and air are adequate. The United Nations, through its assembly and committees, must be supported. There is as yet no other organisation to which man can hopefully look. Therefore, he must support the United Nations, but, at the same time, let this group of world leaders know what is needed. The World Economic Council, or whatever body represents the resources of the world, must free itself from fraudulent politics capitalistic influence and its devious scheming. It must set the resources of the earth free for the use of humanity. This will be a lengthy task, but it will be possible when world need is better appreciated. An enlightened public opinion will make the decisions of the Economic Council practical and possible. Sharing and cooperation must be taught instead of greed and competition. There must be freedom to travel everywhere in any direction and in any country. By means of this free intercourse, members of the human family may get to know each other and to appreciate each other. Passports and visas should be discontinued because they are symbols of the great heresy of separateness. This is no mystical or impractical program. It does not work through the process of exposing, undermining or attack. It emphasises the new politics, that is, politics which are based upon the principle of bringing about right human relations. The trained use of power on the side of goodwill and on behalf of right human relations will be demonstrated as possible, and the present unhappy state of world affairs can be changed. This will be done not through the usual warlike measures of the past, or the enforced will of some aggressive or wealthy group, but through the weight of a trained public opinion, an opinion which will be based on goodwill, on an intelligent understanding of the needs of humanity, on a determination to bring about right human relations, and on the recognition that the problems with which humanity is today confronted can be solved through goodwill. That concludes the quote source from The Problems of Humanity by Alice A. Bailey. (music) 
You're listening to the World Teacher Program on Wellington's Access Radio 106.1 FM. This next article, titled As Men Look Back by Benjamin Krems Master, was featured in the June 2008 issue of Share International magazine. It begins. A few years from now, looking back, men will wonder why they hesitated so long in taking the obvious and most natural action, sharing the resources of the world. Experiencing warmly the new stability, the lack of tension, the ease of international cooperation, men will wonder how they could have been so blind to the self-evident, so willful and destructive to their own best interests for so long. Humanity stands now at the threshold of an entirely new experience in which every global decision and act will be seen to be for the better, as nourishing and sanctifying their lives and strengthening the bonds of brotherhood which, up till then, they had ignored and all but forgotten. Gladly, men will now work together for the common good, the hatred and distrust of the past put firmly behind them. Thus will a new kinship emerge as goodwill and respect, like vitalizing yeast, saturate their awakened lives. Thus too, in ever-strengthening measure, will love and joy embrace and lighten the hearts of men and women everywhere. What subtle alchemy can it be that will work this magic transformation in the lives of men? Not alchemy, but the divinity which dwells in the hearts of men themselves, evoked and brought forth by the wonder of Maitreya's love. Sharing, he has said, is divine. The first step into sharing is the first step into your divinity. In man himself lies the full measure of that divinity. Sharing will demonstrate that man is a potential god and is equipped to express the creative will of his source. Slowly but surely, that creative purpose will manifest through men and so direct their actions and decisions. The old lawlessness will wither away and disappear like a faded memory of a distant childish past. So will it be. We, your elder brothers, see ever more clearly the outlines of a brilliant future stretching ahead for men. We see the blueprints of a science which would astonish the most fertile and sophisticated minds of today. We see too an art whose beauty and creative power has never as yet been seen by men. Above all, we recognize that this creative outflow unprecedented in scope in human history, is the inevitable result of the great inner change through which humanity is passing, learning to live within the laws of life. When men see and understand this consciously as a fact of life, they will take gladly the steps which lead directly to peace and justice, freedom and right relationship. That first step is called sharing. With Maitreya, the Lord of Love, and his group of masters to help and guide, how can men fail to see that sharing and right relationship are the same, have the same impulse to demonstrate the urge to unity which underlies our apparent separation, and so reveal the true nature of men as gods? That concludes the Master's article. We'll now play Maitreya's message number 93, as given through Benjamin Krem, in which Maitreya talks of love and sharing, justice and freedom. My dear friends, I am happy indeed to be so close to you once again. My mission continues with success. My heart enfolds all who think 
of me. My love embraces all who love their brothers. Know this to be true and call on my aid. When you see me, you will know that there is among you now a simple man of God, a man like other men, but one who from time long past has followed a certain path who knows well that path and can lead you thereon. That path to God, my friends, is the treasure I hold for you. Awaken your minds and hearts to this possibility and reach the goal. The way is simple. The way is sure. My teaching will guide you there. No man need fear for the future when my shield shall cover him. No man need fear, want, when my principle governs. No man need feel separate from God when my way beckons. Hold yourself in readiness for my words. Take your places at my side. Make manifest the God within and Transform the world. My heart aches when I see so many needlessly die. Hunger and pestilence Stock the earth. Nothing so moves me to grief than this shame. The crime of separation must be driven 
from this world. I affirm that as my purpose. I address you tonight as those who seek the truth. My friends, the truth stands among you. The truth is in your hearts. The truth, my friends, my brothers and sisters, is love and sharing, justice and freedom. Make these manifest in your lives and communities and re-establish the plan of God. And that's our program for today. If you have any questions or would like to know more about the World Teacher, Maitreya and the Masters of Wisdom, please call us on 0636461011 or visit the website share-international.org where you'll find more information on the various aspects of the emergence. To inquire about Share International magazine subscriptions, books by Benjamin Krem or our monthly free of charge newsletter, the number is 04 234 or write to P.O. Box 9576 Wellington. Thank you for listening to us on Wellington's Access Radio 106.1 FM. And please tune in to our next World Teacher Program on Saturday the 13th of April at the usual time of 10 a.m. You can listen again to this program and previous ones by visiting our website at share-international-nz.info and click on the radio tab. Mm-hmm.